Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kelsey Atkinson, and I am an attorney with the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. Today's presentation, we'll be discussing after your COVID-19 rental debt hearing. So this presentation has a couple of goals. First, we're going to explain what a judgment for COVID-19 rental debt means. Then we'll be talking about what options judgment debtors have after a COVID-19 rental judgment rental debt judgment is entered. And our agenda breaks down into a couple of parts. First, we'll discuss after your hearing, so break down what the court's decision means. Then we'll go through some of your options after a judgment is entered, including contesting a judgment, paying a judgment, what to do if you cannot pay a judgment, and how to respond if the judgment creditor attempts to collect the judgment. Before we get into today's content, content I want to preface that we will not be discussing the eviction process or eviction protections in this presentation today. If you are looking for information on the eviction process or any eviction protections in LA County, I encourage you to check out Stay Housed LA at stayhousedla.org, or you can submit a request for assistance by calling the phone number on the screen. So now I'll get into our content for today with the first part of the presentation. So after your small claims court hearing, what does the court's decision for rental debt mean? After your small claims court hearing, the decision will be sent to you in the mail to the address on file with the court. So it's very important to keep your mailing address and information up to date with the court. If you move at any point in time, you can file a change of address with the court clerk using a court form MC040. So the court's decision is called a judgment, and the judgment will say if you owe money to the person that sued you, and if you do, how much. So if you, in a rental debt case, if you are the tenant, you winning the case means the court decides that you do not owe the landlord any money. The case will typically be dismissed either with prejudice, meaning the plaintiff cannot refile another action on the same claims, or it'll be dismissed without prejudice, meaning the plaintiff is allowed to refile another court case on the same claims. If you won the case, so if you received a document from the court saying they decided you do not owe the landlord any of the money they requested in the lawsuit, then no further action is required on your part, and the landlord is not able to appeal the court's decision on this. If you lost the case, this means the court has decided that you owe some amount of money to the plaintiff. After a money judgment is entered, some of the terminology in the case changes. So the plaintiff, the person that sued you, becomes the judgment creditor, and you, the defendant, become what's known as a judgment debtor. Once a judgment is entered by the court, you do have some options to contest the judgment, including to possibly appeal the judgment, move to vacate the judgment, or you have some options to pay the judgment, all of which we're going to review um, in the coming slides. So this, this is an overview of the post-judgment process here. Um, I find that flowcharts can just be a helpful way to visualize what some of the processes look like. Um, and we're going to discuss all of these different processes and options in the next portions of the presentation, but I'll leave this up for a moment uh, for folks to take a look at. All right. So the first option you have after receiving a judgment from the court is you do have an option to contest the judgment if you disagree with the outcome of the case. So there are two options to contest the judgment. One is to file an appeal. An appeal is appropriate if you attended the initial small claims hearing and you disagree with the court's decision. 
You can file an appeal, meaning you are requesting a new hearing, also known as a de novo hearing, in front of a new judge. When you file an appeal, you basically get an entire, an entire, a second chance to pre present your case in front of a new judge. So you are even allowed to present new or different evidence. And in a small claims appeal, you can be represented by an attorney. To request an appeal, you need to file a form SC-140 with the court clerk within 30 days of the court's decision. If you do not file an appeal within this 30-day period, the judgment does become final. You must file a request for an appeal within those first 30 days. The other option to contest a judgment is you can request to vacate the judgment. A request to vacate is only appropriate if you did not attend your small claims court hearing for some reason. So a motion to vacate is a request to the court asking them to cancel the default judgment that was entered in when you were absent at the hearing. There are two different types of situations where you can be requesting the judgment be vacated. So if you were not at the hearing because you had a good cause reason for not being there, such as your car broke down, so you weren't able to make it to court um, or something along those lines, then you need to file a motion to vacate with the court within 30 days of the judgment being entered. If you do not request the judgment be vacated within those 30 days, the judgment will become final. The exception to this rule is if you were not aware of the lawsuit. So if you were never served with the small claims complaint telling you to go to court, you had no idea there was a court case filed against you until after the court hearing happened, then you can file a motion to vacate anytime within 180 days of learning about the court's judgment. So that is the only exception to that 30 day rule. So if you do not want to contest the judgment uh, then, and you wanna consider payment options, we'll go through what the options are for that here. Before paying the judgment, consider your, abil consider your ability to pay. Is your income consistent and predictable? Will you be able to stay current on rent going forward? And do you have money saved for an emergency or unexpected event? You do have some different options with respect to payment. You can pay the judgment lump sum in full directly to the plaintiffs, also known as the judgment creditor, or you can pay the judgment in full to the court. If you're not able to pay the judgment in full, you can also um, request to make installment payments instead. You have the option to pay the judgment creditor at any time. To pay the full amount directly to the judgment creditor, you can, uh, you can submit the payment to them and request that the judgment creditor file a document called an acknowledgement of satisfaction of judgment with the court within 14 days of receipt of payment. If the judgment creditor does not file the acknowledgement of satisfaction of judgment, you can go to the small claims clerk's office and request to complete a declaration of judgment debtor regarding satisfaction of judgment. This form is not available online and you have to go to the court in person to complete this document. When you go to complete this document, you need to bring with you proof of the payment you submitted to the judgment creditor. If you do not feel comfortable submitting the, the payment directly to the judgment creditor, you're also able to pay using the court as an intermediary. In order to do that, you can complete a form SC-145 and bring payment of the amount owed to the court and drop it off with the court clerk. Anytime you're making a payment on a judgment, always keep records of your payment, including how much was paid, when it was paid, and who you made the payment to. If you're unable to pay the judgment in full, you can also you can request to enter into a payment plan. And again, there's two options for that. You can informally request that the judgment creditor agree to a payment plan in writing, or you can request the court to approve a payment plan by filing a form SC-220 and a financial statement with the court clerk. One word of caution with respect to requesting a payment plan through the court. If you miss a payment in a court-ordered payment plan, 
the judgment creditor can notify the court that you failed to make a payment and the entire unpaid balance remaining on the judgment will become due, meaning it essentially cancels out that installment payment plan that you um, reached. So if you're going to request a payment plan through the court, be sure that it is a payment plan that you are going to be able to consistently pay. General tips when it comes to payment plans, always get terms in writing. Do not agree to anything you do not understand and request clear instructions regarding the total amount to be paid, the amount of each payment, the total number of payments that will be made, who to direct payment to, the date of each payment, and acceptable payment method or methods. It can be helpful to request a grace period or an opportunity to cure in the event of a missed or late payment and try to avoid terms permitting late fees or interest. Keep records of all of your payments and be sure to clearly indicate what each payment is for. So when you write out a payment, indicate that it is for, you know, payment one of 12 on this court judgment so that you have clear records of the intention of that payment. Now we'll discuss what happens if you cannot or do not pay the court judgment. If you cannot afford to pay the judgment or you do not plan to pay, be sure to mail a judgment debtor statement of assets form to the judgment creditor within 30 days of receiving the court's decision. This is a form that outlines information about where you bank, where you work, your sources of income, and if you own any property or assets. You do not have to file this form with the court. You only need to send it to the judgment creditor. If you do not submit the judgment, if you do not submit this form to the judgment creditor, the judgment creditor can request you to appear at a judgment debtor hearing. A judgment debtor hearing um, is uh, a court hearing where you will be required by a subpoena to come to court and testify about how much money you make, where you work or bank, and the property you own. Failure to appear at a judgment debtor hearing after you receive the subpoena can result in issuance of a bench warrant. A judgment creditor may not be able to collect money from you if you are considered collection proof. Collection proof is a person who does not have sufficient income or assets that can be taken from them for repayment of a debt such as a court judgment. A person that is collection proof is exempt from collection efforts by the judgment creditor. And so there are some common assets that are protected from collection. And many of these, exem these exemptions are defined under state and federal law. Some common exemptions to be aware of is social security and other public benefit payments are exempt from being collected to pay a court judgment. Bank account funds below a balance of $2,080 are protected from being levied from a bank account. Note that this $2,080 amount is an amount that is adjusted annually is subject to change. So this $2,080 amount is the, is the uh, minimum amount of money that must remain in a bank account as of November, 2023. 75% of your wages are protected from being garnished through a wage garnishment. And money, additional money you can prove you need to support yourself or your family members may also be exempt from collection. So what can you do if you are collection proof? One thing you can do is send a letter to the judgment creditor, letting them know that you are collection proof and request that they stop contacting you. You can also wait to see if the judgment creditor takes steps to enforce the judgment and complete steps to file a claim of exemption if the judgment debtor, a debtor attempts to enforce the judgment. And we're going to discuss how to request a claim of exemption later in this presentation. A note on being collection proof. Collection proof is not a permanent status. If you start earning more income in the future, you, the judgment creditor may be able to garnish your wages or levy your bank accounts for that unprotected income at any point in time, as long as the judgment is still valid. So if you are judgment, if you are collection proof now because, you know, you're receiving um, workers compensation and you're otherwise, you know, not working, um, you know, if you go back to work and your income goes up significantly, your savings accounts start to fill again, then you may no longer be collection proof. So
So um, just be aware that even if you are perhaps collection proof now, if your situation improves or changes, you may not have all of your assets may not be protected from collection in the future. And for more information on what exactly are exempt assets, I would recommend looking at these resources. The Sacramento Law Library has a really helpful page where they explain the income and property uh, that creditors can't seize. And also this form from the California courts lists out the um, dozens of different types of exempt property and the source um, from state and federal law that supports um, these exemptions. Other considerations with respect to um, rental debt. So individuals with significant or multiple debts may consider filing for bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a legal process to release or discharge a debtor from certain debt obligations. Um, the benefits of bankruptcy is it can eliminate most or all unsecured debts and it stops collection activity on any of the released debts. The downside of bankruptcy is that it does appear on your credit report for 10 years and it impacts your ability to obtain rentals, loans, and credit cards in the future. Certain types of debts are also not able to be discharged in bankruptcy, and that includes income tax debt, child or spousal support debt, student loans, traffic tickets, and government fines. Um, and there are resources available to help uh, folks understand if bankruptcy is an option they may want to uh, pursue. Um, so there are legal services providers that provide consultations and information on this, including neighborhood legal services and public counsel. Both of these organizations are specific to Los Angeles and assist folks in um, uh, Los Angeles County and the city of LA. <laughs> I would also recommend taking a look at this video on the public counsel website called Dealing with Debt, Bankruptcy and Beyond. It's about a 45 minute long video that really succinctly walks through some of the considerations on whether bankruptcy might be a fit and um, details some of these steps in the bankruptcy process. An additional protection that applies to COVID-19 rental debt that folks should be aware of is COVID-19 rental debt um, as defined under state law as unpaid rental, unpaid, unpaid rent from March, 2020 through September, 2021 cannot be sold or assigned if the individual would have qualified for the rental assistance program. And that means that the person was financially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and they had a household income at or below a metric called 80% of the area median income. So this debt cannot be sold or assigned for those qualifying households, meaning that it cannot be sold or transferred to a third party, such as a debt collector or account resolution agency. So if you are being contacted by a debt collector for any of the unpaid rent or obligations that accrued from this March 2020 to September 2021 period, um, this debt may have been illegally assigned to the debt collector, and they may not actually be allowed to be contacting you to collect this date, uh, debt under state law. This The date um, of what what months of rent are being requested is important here. So any rental debt from October 2021 onwards can be sold or assigned to third parties. And that, um, But one thing to be aware of is that debt collectors must comply with fair debt collection practices that are set, for, set out under state and federal law. Debt collectors cannot harass or threaten you. They cannot make false or misleading statements. And they cannot call you at unusual or inconvenient times. One option you have if you are being contacted by debt collectors is you can send a no contact letter to a debt collector and request that they stop contacting you about payment of the debt. And we have some resources for debt collection here as well. Uh, in particular, I want to point out the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So this is the federal agency that focuses on enforcing a lot of these consumer protection laws. Their website has a bunch of um, really helpful educational guides that walk you through certain aspects of dealing with debt and dealing with collectors. They even have step-by-step -step guides on how to send a no contact letter, how to send debt verification letters, um, and a couple other things. So this is a really helpful and important resource um, that I would encourage um, anyone taking a look at. 
All right. So lastly, we're going to talk about how to respond if the judgment creditor tries to enforce or collect the judgment from you. So if you do not pay the court judgment within 30 days, the judgment creditor then may take action to enforce the judgment. Enforcing the judgment means taking legal action to collect the money owed to them as ordered by the court. A money judgment from a COVID-19 rental debt case is valid for 10 years and can be renewed for an additional 10 years after that. The judgment creditor can take action to collect the judgment at any point in time during that first 10 year period. And if they renew the judgment, they can continue to try to collect the judgment during that additional 10 year period. Some common enforcement actions that um, judgment creditors may take include requesting a bank levy or seeking wage garnishment. If you receive a notice of any type of enforcement action, you have two options. First, you can accept or do nothing. So if you receive a notice of bank levy, you can allow the funds to be taken from your bank account um, and just and move on. Or if you are collection proof or have exempt assets, you can respond by filing, filing a claim of exemption and trying to protect your assets. So we're gonna go through the steps to request a claim of exemption and try to um, hold off a bank levy as well as um, a wage garnishment action on the next slide. So um, first, a bank levy. So a bank levy is an enforcement action that a judgment creditor can take that will allow them to take money directly out of your bank account to pay down the um, amount, of, amount of money owed to them on the court judgment. If you are served with a notice of bank levy um, or you receive any uh, um, information regarding a bank levy from your um, bank you need and you wish to respond, you need to file a claim of exemption and a financial statement within 15 days. You complete these forms, the EJ-160 and EJ-165, which is a financial statement form. You then provide two copies of this form to the levying officer. So you actually do not take this to the court clerk. You take it to the levying officer, which is typically going to be the sheriff. Um, and you'll find the information for the levying officer on the EJ-150 notice of bank levy form. Once you file your claim of exemption, the judgment creditor has 10 days to either accept your claim of exemption or they may oppose your claim. If they accept your claim of exemption, your property, meaning your funds, will be returned. If they oppose your claim, you will receive opposing documents and you will be ordered to go to court for a hearing date where the judge will hear your arguments for why you think your assets are exempt and the judgment creditor's options for what arguments for why they believe they should be able to access the funds. One important exception um, with respect to bank levies is that in the state of California, bank accounts can never be levied below $2,080. So this means that your bank account cannot be um, completely wiped out. Um, they're only allowed to, uh, they're only allowed to uh, levy from the bank account down to the $2,080. And here are some resources for bank levies. So there is actually a, um, the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles has a self-help guide that walks you through how to fill out the forms to file a claim of exemption from a bank levy. The Sacramento Law Library also has a similar guide and you can find more information about responding to a bank levy on the California Courts self-help page as well. Now I'm going to talk about how to respond to um, a request for wage garnishment that submitted by the judgment creditor. So a wage garnishment is can be used by the judgment creditor um, to try and have your employer um, turn over a certain amount of your wages to the judgment creditor so that they can make those pay that money towards um, you know, towards the court judgment amount. So if You'll know a wage garnishment order has been entered if you receive an earnings withholding order, which is a form WG002, or your employer may notify you that they've received an earnings withholding order. If you want to file a claim of exemption to try and protect your wages from being garnished, you again need to respond within 15 days and you need to file a form called a claim of exemption and again provide a financial statement to accompany that claim of exemption. 
you will bring two copies of these forms to the levying officer. And then the judgment creditor has 10 days to either accept or oppose your claim of exemption. Again, if they accept your claim, then your um, property, your wages will be returned. If they oppose your claim, you will receive opposing documents and be ordered to go to court. A couple of notes on what is protected in terms of how much of your wages can be garnished. So um, under California law, only 25% of your take-home pay can be garnished from each paycheck. If you can prove that you need additional portions of your earnings to support yourself or your family, that may also be protected. I, and also note that your wages may be protected even more, so more than 25% of your wages may pr be protected from garnishment if you make minimum wage and work less than 40 hours per week. And again, here are some resources on filing a claim of exemption from a wage garnishment action. So the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles has a self-help guide on their website, as does the Sacramento Law Library and the California Courts. So that gets us to the end of our presentation for today. I do have a couple of resources on here that I would like to point out. So one is um, the Laugh Law Renters Small Claims Project has a resource library where you can learn more specifically about the impacts of COVID-19 rental debt judgments on um, and um, credit reporting issues. The LA Law, Law Library is also an excellent resource for support. The LA County Small Claims Advisor, which is run by the Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, has a really helpful website that includes a video library, and they also have sample court forms on their website. The California Court Self-Help Library has a step-by-step -step guide for navigating the small claims court process. And you can access all of the court forms I've mentioned in this presentation on the California Court's uh, Judicial Council website. You can download all these courts uh, court forms for free on their website there. You can look up the forms by the form number, which is why I have the form numbers included throughout the presentation. Again, Stay Housed LA is a great resource for tenants here in Los Angeles County. You can uh, submit a request for assistance on their website or by calling the number on the screen. You can also register to attend workshops on a variety of topics um, relating to um, tenants, tenants' rights in Los Angeles at stayhousedla.org and by clicking on the workshops tab. And if you need, if you're still following up with the rental assistance program, which there are still some straggling cases out there, um, this is their uh, website and their phone number. So that's all we have for today. I wanna thank everybody for joining us.